The Life and Deaths of the USS Cyclops Only God and the sea know what happened to the great ship. Woodrow Wilson, 28th President of the United States of America The USS Cyclops was a Proteus-class collier ship of the United States Navy. Its keel was laid at the Cramp shipyard of the William Cramp & Sons Shipbuilding Company a Philadelphian firm with an established history of constructing Navy battleships, cruisers, and other maritime transports. The identity of the Cyclops was twofold. As an individual ship, she had been named after the race of one-eyed giants featured commonly in the tales of Greek mythology. On the other hand, her pseudo-surname under the classification of a Proteus-class collier ship was given to her by her younger sister, the USS Proteus who was to be the lead ship of the class. As a collier, she was designed as a bulk cargo ship meant to transport large amounts of coal for long distances. Her approximate length of 542 feet from stem to stern, one and a half times the size of a football field, as well as her depth of 40 feet, provided her with an astonishing capacity for coal storage. Her overall bulk possessed a displacement of approximately 19,360 tons, she had a breadth of 65 feet and a draft of 27, with a pair of triple expansion steam engines granting her a maximum speed of 15 knots, she could freight a maximum load of 12,500 tons of coal. With her finished construction and launch on the 7th of May 1910, Cyclops would become part of an infamous sisterhood of four, a family of quintuplets whose fortunes would come to mark them as among the most mysterious nautical tragedies of the 20th century. This is her story. The launch of the Cyclops on the 7th of May 1910 would make her the eldest daughter of the Proteus Sisterhood. Her launch would be echoed by that of her sibling, the USS Jupiter, on August 24th, 1912, the USS Proteus on September 14th, 1912, and finally the latecomer, USS Nereus, on April 26th, 1913. All the ships would notably bear a nomenclature relating to Greek and or Roman mythology. All would also quickly find themselves added to the ranks of the United States Navy in short order. Such was the ultimate intent of their creation for the coal-hungry ships of the 20th century USN. While the Jupiter, Proteus, and Nereus would be officially commissioned in the same year of 1913, the Cyclops would bear witness to a world reversal. She would be the last of the four to be officially commissioned becoming so on May 1st, 1917. By then, however, she already possessed experience in the service of the United States Armed Forces. In fact, she possessed more of it than her sisters by ident of her status as the firstborn. Less than seven years prior to her commissioning and six months after her launch, the Cyclops entered the Naval Auxiliary Service. She sailed within the scope of operations of the Atlantic Fleet, a service component command of the US Navy established in 1906 by President Theodore Roosevelt. Keep in mind, this will not be the last time you hear the name Roosevelt in this story. Initially meant to protect newly established naval bases within the Caribbean after the Spanish-American War of 1898, in the 1910s, the fleet's theater of responsibilities had grown to encompass the wider Atlantic. Cyclops would find her place in the rising influence of the growing superpower by voyaging into the Baltic Sea in order to resupply elements of the fleet's second division. There, she would rub shoulders with older vessels such as the battleships USS Louisiana and USS New Hampshire. After returning to Norfolk, Virginia, she operated along the East Coast from Newport, Rhode Island to the Caribbean, a region she would gradually become more and more familiar with, further servicing the Atlantic fleet with her coal as she went. The Cyclops would soon play her first major support role during a conflict in Central America. U.S.-Mexico relations, already strained by the Mexican-American War, would fracture in the wake of the Tampico Affair. On April 9, 1914, nine U.S. sailors of a whaleboat belonging to the dispatch vessel USS Dolphin were arrested by Mexican authorities. At the time, they were unarmed. They had been trying to collect the purchase of coal and gasoline for their ship from a German civilian at Tampico's docks. They were hardly finished when they were held at gunpoint by a squad of Mexican soldiers and taken into custody for trespassing. Though they were eventually released, upon hearing of the incident, Squadron Commander Rear Admiral Henry Mayo demanded a formal apology from the Mexican government, then under the regime of the dictator General Victoriano Huerta. 
Mayo demanded that the Mexican officer in charge of the incident be arrested and that there be a 21-gun salute to the American flag. Though the officer was arrested and a formal apology was issued, the act of a salute to a foreign flag was deemed too humiliating by Mexican authorities and was refused. Mayo, however, continued to press that America's honor had been besmirched, soon gaining the agreement of President Woodrow Wilson. With neither side backing down, the situation would continue to escalate until, on April 14th, Wilson would order the Atlantic Fleet, under the command of Vice Admiral Charles Johnson Badger, to Mexican waters. Seeking to unseat the Mexican dictator, after receiving congressional approval for the use of armed forces, Wilson authorized U.S. landings on the beaches of the city of Veracruz. Hoping to prevent an arriving shipment of arms from a German vessel, a force of U.S. Marines and sailors were sent to land. They would shortly be met with local resistance. What was initially a surgical strike meant to capture key infrastructure in Veracruz would turn into a full-blown invasion. The city would be taken over by a force of 6,000 U.S. troops and occupied for seven months. The invasion would set off a wave of anti-North American revolts across Latin America. The revolts were the most intense in Mexico, where 50,000 resident Americans were already living. It was so bad that in places like Baja California, the U.S. Consul had to take shelter with 250 fellow citizens in the U.S. Consulate building, from which he would request the presence of a Navy warship. Many of the Americans living in Mexico were expelled from the country and forced to leave behind everything they owned. It was during this time that the Cyclops would distinguish herself in the Veracruz expedition. She provided coal to U.S. ships on patrol as well as lent herself to the evacuation effort. She would transport American refugees from Tampico across the Gulf of Mexico to refugee camps that had been established for them in New Orleans, an act for which she would receive the thanks of the U.S. State Department. With the outbreak of the First World War and America's entry into the conflict on April 4, 1917, the Cyclops would soon find her place in the historical limelight. The United States Army needed transports to get its men and material to France. Thus, a select committee of five presidentially nominated and senatorially approved shipping executives, known as the United States Shipping Board USSB, were made to examine American ship registries. The committee selected 14 American flagged ships that were sufficiently fast, could carry enough fuel in their bunkers for transatlantic crossings, and, most vitally, were in port or not far out at sea. The Cyclops was among the 14 that met these criteria. She was commissioned on May 1, 1917, making her one of the first ships to be acquired for this specific service. She would be brought into the Cruiser and Transportation Force, then under the command of Rear Admiral Albert Glaives. As part of a unit of the Atlantic Fleet, her crew would be changed out, replaced by sailors and officers of the U.S. Navy. It is at this time that a naval officer named Lieutenant Commander George Worley will be placed in command of her. The Cyclops was among ten of the ships that were quickly refitted for the war. Her cooking and toilet facilities were significantly expanded in order to handle the vast number of troops and personnel she would soon be asked to carry. In addition, berthing spaces were added wherever possible. Each of the ten ships also had gun platforms installed for anti-submarine defenses. From there, the Cyclops would make her way to the Brooklyn Navy Yard where her guns would be bolted to her gun platforms and certified to work correctly. Once finished, she would be made to operate in the first American naval convoy to sail to Europe, designated Convoy No. 1. Altogether, the convoy consisted of 14 troop ships and 13 armed escorts. On June 7, 1917, Admiral Glaives gave secret orders for all 14 ships of the first convoy to assemble in the North River. They gathered at the anchorage of Tompkinsville on Staten Island, New York. At sunrise on a very foggy morning on the 14th of June, 1917, the convoy hoisted anchor. It then began its voyage across the submarine-infested waters of the Atlantic. Each of the four groups sailed out, at regular intervals of two hours, from the Ambrose lightship. However, the last group was delayed by 24 hours. Cyclops would function as one of the escorts for Group 3. She would guard ships carrying the first American troops to Europe, including the transports USS Mallory, USS Finland, and USS San Jacinto. Three destroyers, USS Allen, Preston, and McCall, as well as a cruiser, USS Charleston, would work alongside the Cyclops in the defense of the troop transports. Outfitted with 4-inch 50-caliber guns, 
and traveling across the Atlantic at a comfortable 13 knot, 24 km per hour pace with the rest of the convoy, she made for the west coast of France. She would help to transport doctors and supplies meant for the American Expeditionary Forces heading into the war. It was just eight days into the voyage that the first attack on the convoy would come. The morning of the 22nd of June brought a torpedo attack on the first group. No damage was done and all ships escaped from the U-boat. The second group was attacked on the 26th of June and the fourth group was attacked on the 29th. The third group, in which the Cyclops was traveling, did not sustain an attack during the voyage. Their destination was the harbor of saint Nazaire, a city on France's west coast. The convoy arrived on July 2nd, 1917, to find a very crowded harbor. Plans were lacking as how to handle the large number of vessels in the harbor at once, and there was widespread confusion. Eventually, however, all troops and material were disembarked. After fulfilling her role in the convoy, she would set sail on a return trip to the East Coast 12 days later. She would spend the bulk of 1917 serving in the area, save for a brief trip to Halifax, Nova Scotia. It should be noted here that the Cyclops was lucky to have left Nova Scotia when she did. Any later, and she might have met her untimely end within the flames of the Halifax explosion, an incident where a Norwegian steamship collided with a French munitions ship, detonating the latter's cargo. What resulted was the single largest explosion in human history up to that point, one whose magnitude would not be outdone until Hiroshima. Over 1,600 people would be killed, 9,000 would be injured, and many nearby ships would be heavily damaged. This would take place on the morning of December 6th of that same year, just a few months shy of the Cyclops' visit. On January 8th, 1918, the Cyclops was ordered to refuel British warships operating in the South Atlantic, specifically within Brazilian waters. She was to carry 9,960 tons of coal meant for British naval forces. Her destination was Rio de Janeiro, the capital city of the state of Rio de Janeiro, as well as the federal seat of power of the then First Brazilian Republic, now known as the Old Republic. Brazil had entered the war on October 26th, the year prior, after the German Navy sank Brazilian civilian ships off the French coast, making her an ally of the USA and Britain in the even tide of the war. Here it should be pointed out that she was also ordered to return from Rio with a consignment of some 11,000 tons of manganese ore. This was most likely to be used for steelworks and munition production back in the States. Though her service as a coaling ship stretched over almost a decade, up to this point she had never been asked to carry manganese. Most of her crew would likewise have had no experience handling the much denser ore. Nevertheless, her orders were set. The Cyclops departed from her home port at the Navy Yard of Norfolk, Virginia, on January 8, 1918, with at least 221 enlisted men and 15 officers, including Lieutenant Commander Worley, a total of 236 personnel. That day would see Naval Officer Conrad A. Nervig come aboard. Though not a member of the crew, he was sent aboard the ship in order to be transferred to the USS Glacier, a Navy store ship waiting in Rio. Prior to setting out, the Cyclops was reportedly so loaded with her cargo of coal, mail and other items meant for the South American patrol fleet, that her plimsoll line was submerged. The plimsoll line is a reference mark located on a ship's hull. It indicates the maximum depth to which the vessel may be safely immersed when loaded with cargo. According to Nervig, the day of January 8th had dawned overcast and cold, with a light snow falling. For days, the harbor had been completely frozen over. Liberty parties from ships at anchor walked on the ice that morning returning to their ships. In plowing through the ice flows in the ship channel, the Cyclops narrowly averted a collision with the USS Surveyor, an armed survey ship. This was the first of a number of foreboding incidents that would take place on the Cyclops' voyage. By nightfall, she had cleared the Virginia Capes and headed southward, breasting the heavy winter seas with a speed and ease amazing for such a heavily loaded vessel. The next day, on January 9th, 1918, the Cyclops would be assigned to the Naval Overseas Transportation Service, an arm of the US Navy responsible for its replenishment and military transport ships. Five days later, on January 13th, the captain ordered Lieutenant Harvey Frank Forbes, the executive officer, to his room. He was to remain there under arrest following a disagreement he had with the captain about work aboard the ship. From all reports, this seemed to be a routine matter in ships commanded by Worley. 
On the evening of the same day, Ensign Kane of Fairview, Colorado, one of the Washington Division officers, believed to be in good health by Nervig, was placed on the sick list and ordered to bed by the doctor, Bert Asper. It was the general opinion of those in the wardroom that this was done to save Mr. Kane from being a victim of the commanding officer's unreasoning temper. Nervig could not recall that the doctor made any comment nor that he was in any way questioned regarding the matter. His act and motive were possibly taken for granted. At this time, Mr. Kane's watch duty had been the mid-watch, which fell to Nervig to relieve him at midnight. The tropical night was temperate under a full moon, providing an escape from the gloom of the wardroom. During this period of Nervig's duty, he supposedly became very well acquainted with Commander Worley, who, according to him, would emerge from his cabin dressed in long woolen underwear, a derby hat, and carrying a cane. In his own words, he, quote, neither apologized for his attire, nor even so much as mentioned it, and my salute and good morning, Captain, could not have been more correct or military. His affability soon relieved my anxiety, as I realized this was no official call, but a purely social one. The visit supposedly lasted two hours, wherein Woolley regaled Nervig with stories of his home and career at sea, only to come back at other times to reminisce with him then as well the latter of which wasn't sure whether he did so out of friendliness or sleeplessness. At some point on the voyage south of Rio de Janeiro, the head of the starboard engine's high-pressure cylinder blew off. This cracked the engine and rendered the entire thing inoperable. The remainder of the trip was made running on just one engine, reducing her speed to 10 knots, much slower than her usual 14. On January 20th, after 12 days at sea, the Cyclops came within sight of the coast of South America off Pernambuco, a state of Brazil, at a distance of about 20 miles. Worley quickly changed course to take her further out. Sailing further south, the Cyclops had reached the city of Salvador, the capital of the state of Bahia, on January 22, 1918, after initially running 48 miles past the entrance to the harbor. Nervig noted that the ship's navigator had protested the situation, stating that three more hours of darkness steaming on that course would have had her aground. The navigator, however, was overruled by Worley. The Cyclops most likely put in either at or near the Bay of All Saints, the largest bay on the Brazilian coast on which Salvador was established. While at port, she delivered coal and supplies to the Omaha-class light cruiser USS Relay. The Cyclops, however, upon getting underway from alongside Relay, ran into her twice. Fortunately, this only led to slight damage. Leaving Salvador, the Cyclops would arrive at Rio de Janeiro on January 28th. She would most likely have pulled in at the port of Rio de Janeiro, a seaport on the western shores of the Guanabara Bay, the second largest bay in Brazil. The balance of her cargo was distributed to the various vessels of the South American patrol fleet at anchor there. Also pleasant at the waters of Rio would be the USS Glacier. From this point, Nervig left the Cyclops and went aboard the Glacier to begin his duties there. However, this would not be his last run-in with the Collier. For her return voyage, the Cyclops proceeded to take aboard her designated cargo of 11,000 tons of manganese ore. At least 57 passengers had also come aboard for the trip back to the States. Among them was a man who would prove to be one of the most unexpected as well as one of the most important. Alfred Louise Moro Gottschalk, US Consul General to Rio de Janeiro, arrived via another transport to the bay. As a high-ranking consul, he was a deeply divisive figure among others in his diplomatic circles, thanks to his distinctly pro-German sentiments. He was also disliked by members of the American colony of Confederados, a diaspora descendant of Confederates who left the US for the Empire of Brazil after the Civil War. At that point, the empire was one of few places left in the West that still upheld the institution of slavery. The latter group would dislike him for supposedly catering to the press for self-aggrandizement rather than representing his own country. By contrast, the consul was greatly loved by the big landowners of Brazil's long-standing oligarchy, as well as by the denizens of the German colony there. Ironically enough, his reason for leaving Brazil would be quite patriotic. Although already 45 years old when the United States entered World War I, he was determined to volunteer for military service. He had written to his old company commander, offering the services of, quote, a portly person growing gray at the temples, but who can still ride a little. 
Without awaiting a reply, he reportedly accepted a Navy invitation to proceed to the United States via the Cyclops. He would immediately become the most important person aboard, aside from the lieutenant commander. On February 15th, the USS Glacier got underway. She proceeded out of the harbor with a Brazilian pilot boat leading the way through the minefields guarding the entrance, taking Nervig out of sight of the Cyclops. The fully loaded Collier would also set out from Rio de Janeiro on February 16th, the next day, but not before Worley logged a formal complaint about his ship's broken engine. The damage was confirmed by a survey board of a naval inquiry, which recommended that the ship return to the US for repairs. There were suggestions that the ship was overloaded when she departed from Rio de Janeiro with her slow speed of 10 knots. Even so, for her service, she would receive the thanks of the State Department, as well as Admiral William B. Caperton, Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet. Departing from Rio de Janeiro, the Cyclops sailed along the Brazilian coast. She would reach her next destination four days later on February 20th. Arriving again at Salvador, she is noted to have arrived from the north. Seeing as Bahia is over 650 nautical miles to the north of Rio de Janeiro, it would normally be expected that she would have arrived from the south, again possibly showcasing the peculiar form of navigation as practiced by the ship under Worley's command, that of overshooting their destination. The USS Glacier had gotten there earlier. Conrad Nervig was there to watch the Cyclops' arrival. He would record that during her brief stay in Bahia, the Cyclops' paymaster, Carol G. Page, his best friend, came aboard the glacier on official business. Carol was a grandson of Senator Page, chairman of the Senate Naval Committee. Nervik says that at his departure, he, as officer of the deck, escorted him to the gangway. Upon leaving, he grasped Nervik's hand in both of his and said very solemnly, Well, goodbye old man, and God bless you. Nervig was deeply impressed with his finality which was truly prophetic in its implication. The Cyclops would remain anchored at Salvador for the next two days, receiving mail from the other naval vessels also anchored there. Then, on the evening of February 22nd, at approximately 1800 hours, she would depart from Bahia and continue to sail north, intending to go on the last leg of her return trip back to Baltimore, Maryland. This would be the last time she was ever seen by U.S. Navy personnel. At some point on her journey, the Cyclops would make a deviation from her original course. Due to the handicap of her damaged starboard engine limiting her to no more than 10 knots, 5 less than her top speed and 4 less than her usual rate of travel, she would sail over 2,000 nautical miles north, eventually passing into the Caribbean Sea. Without warning, on March 3rd, she would arrive at the island of Barbados, most likely at the capital of Bridgetown and its principal natural harbor, the crescent-shaped waters of Carlisle Bay. In so doing, Lieutenant Commander Worley would send out a message to inform the Navy of his arrival there. Quote, Arrived Barbados, West Indies, 1730, 530 p.m., for Bunker Coal. Arrived Baltimore, Maryland, March 13th. Notify Office Director Naval Auxiliaries. Commander, Cyclops. At the time, Barbados was still a colony of the British Empire, the US's ally in the war. This was an unscheduled stop for the Collier, however. As such, her captain had to follow a usual protocol, which required that he go to visit the US consulate on the island, doing so on the following day. The US consul to Barbados at the time, a Charles Ludlow Livingston, received Lieutenant Commander Worley as well as the higher-ranking US consul general to Rio de Janeiro himself, Alfred Goschak. Goschak had tagged along with Worley on his visit to the consulate, possibly to discuss diplomatic affairs with Livingston. Brockholz Livingston, the latter's 13-year-old son, would record more than a decade later that the ship's captain, Commander Worley, and several other guests including Goschak, had tea at the consulate. Charles Ludlow himself had learned much of the purpose of the Cyclops and her crew in being on the island. According to a report that he would file later to the Office of Naval Intelligence, he noticed a number of key aspects about her crew, her captain, and her as a ship. Worley had told him during their meeting that he required 600 tons of coal. By then, he had sufficient aboard his ship to reach the more northerly island of Bermuda, some 1,200 nautical miles further north. However, his ship's engines were still in poor condition. Worley noted that the Cyclops was in need of a resupply, and he did not have sufficient funds on him for the necessary transactions. 
As such, he requested Charles, as the US Consul, to make the payments for him. Charles acquiesced and helped him to purchase one ton of fresh meat, one ton of flour, and 1,000 pounds of vegetables, costing him $775. This comes up to between $13,000 to over $16,000 worth of supplies in today's currency. During their conversation, Charles noticed that Worley was unusually reserved. He would find out through other sources that his crew referred to him as, quote, the damned Dutchman. He learned that he was disliked by other officers aboard and that there had even been a disturbance on the ship prior to its arrival at Barbados. This was most likely an attempted mutiny that Nervig later pointed out in his testimony. Both men alluded to one having taken place which the lieutenant commander had quickly stomped out. One man was believed to have been executed and a few others locked up. Further, the ship was transporting three general courts martial prisoners in her brig. These men had been transferred to the Cyclops from the fleet operating in the waters off Brazil. All of them had been convicted for the murder of a shipmate and sentenced to prison terms ranging from 50 to 99 years. According to Charles's son Brockholst, before the group of guests had departed, they had signed his sister's autograph book, noting that their signatures were, quote, probably the latest ones in existence. No one, of course, thought there was any danger in the voyage, he would go on to say. At around 5 o'clock or 1700 hours, Worley, Gottschalk, and their group would leave the consulate. Brockholz and others would watch them from the beach as they returned aboard the Cyclops. By then, the ship was at a slight list and floating low in the water, leaving her plimsoll line submerged. Now with at least 309 people aboard, the ship issued several blasts from her whistle and began to back out of the bay. Then, moving forward, she steamed south, back out onto the sea. Supposedly, her last message after clearing port was, quote, Weather fair, all well. She presumably attempted to resume her course for Baltimore on that evening of March 4th. Brockhall's notes, quote, We did not consider this course odd until a few weeks later, when we got a cable requesting full details of her visit to Barbados. The Cyclops was due at Baltimore on March 13th. However, that Wednesday would come and go with no sign of the ship. So would the next day, and the day after that, and the day after that. No further messages would be received from her. No SOS signal would ever be sent out. The USS Cyclops would simply and suddenly stop communicating. When she failed to make Baltimore on March 23rd, she was officially declared missing. Every naval ship in the vicinity of the Caribbean, from Cuba to Puerto Rico, was alerted of the situation and commenced a search of her entire track from Barbados. They kept a keen eye out for a massive debris field, presupposing that a German submarine had torpedoed her, or that perhaps an uncharted minefield had sunk her. All the while, the disconcerting fact remained that no SOS signal was ever received from the ship, something that was of course standard protocol for a vessel facing imminent destruction at least if she even had the time to send one. No debris was ever found. There was no driftwood. There were no life preservers. There was no floating cargo, coal, or manganese ore. There were no bodies. For all intents and purposes, it seemed to the bewildered Navy that the 19,000 ton USS Cyclops, her 11,000 ton consignment of ore, as well as all her passengers, crew, and officers, over 309 souls, had simply vanished off the face of the Atlantic. As the First World War was still in its final months, the Navy made no public announcement that the Cyclops was missing. Its upper echelons withheld the information about her disappearance until there was more evidence that something had actually gone wrong. American wireless stations continually intercepted messages from enemy craft, but heard no call for assistance. Radio queries combed the entire Atlantic 24-7 for 10 days straight, but came away with no solid answer as to sightings of the ship. All commercial vessels were requested to look out for wreckage that might indicate the fate of the Cyclops. French and American ships searched trade routes between the two ports, but found no trace either of her or of those that had been aboard. Across the board, their searches came up empty. American diplomatic agents abroad were instructed to seek any information on her, 
The German Navy itself, still an enemy of the US, was also investigated. Wireless messages were examined from the German naval headquarters, most likely the North Sea Naval Station at Wilhelmshaven that managed the high seas fleet. Misses from the headquarters to German submarines were decoded. No answer was revealed on this front either. No submarine commanders had come forward, either publicly or in their private missives to their superiors on the mainland, they lay claim to having sunk the collier. Moreover, even though submarines were known to haunt the Caribbean Sea, and the lone ship would have made for a perfect target, there were no submarines present along the route that the Cyclops was suspected to have taken. On April 15th, one month after she failed to make port, the Navy finally released the news to the Associated Press that the Collier was overdue. This was met with the open concern and shock of many across the nation, a number of whom were the families and loved ones of the lost 309. There were calls and demands from family members and journalists for more answers, answers which the Navy was itself still struggling to provide. The exhaustive search was continued even 100 days later into the month of June, with no luck, by which time a decision had to be made. On June 1, 1918, Franklin D. Roosevelt, then Assistant Secretary of the Navy, declared the Cyclops to be officially lost with all hands. All 309 aboard were pronounced deceased, much of the anxiety turned grief of their worried families and friends. The First World War would end on November 11th of that same year. Though many of its survivors would strive or struggle to pick up the pieces of old lives or to create new ones in the wake of the war, the fate of the USS Cyclops would remain an enduring mystery, one difficult in its own right to fully piece together over 100 years later. On March 2nd, 1918, just a day prior to the Cyclops' last known stop, the steamship and tanker Amolco departed from the island of Barbados. She was bound for Boston carrying as her cargo a fresh delivery of molasses. On March 9th, she was traveling just off the coast of Virginia when she supposedly spotted the collier on her way to Baltimore, the latter having possibly caught up to her or at least come within sight. This occurrence was even recorded in the ship's log. The weather off the Virginia Capes on the following Sunday, March 10th, was reportedly violent. W.J. Riley, third officer aboard the Amalco, had reported to the Washington Times newspaper that he believed the Cyclops had been lost in a storm that swept the seas 125 miles south of the island of Nantucket. The Amalco herself was caught in this storm and received damages to the extent of $130,000, roughly $2,600,000 in today's currency. Riley believed that the speed of the Cyclops would have placed her directly within the destructive path of the gale. To add to that, various weather services reported a massive destructive storm in the general vicinity of the Capes. It is proposed that a series of problems compounded together, accentuated by the harsh weather, to cause the ship to sink such a short distance from Baltimore. At the time, this idea served to heartbreakingly debunk the claims of Mistress Samuel W. Worley, the wife of the Cyclops' captain who made a statement the day before that the Cyclops was safe. Her claims had been based on rumors, as well as a telephone conversation she'd had with a friend, a naval officer, who assured her that the Cyclops was safe and would be heard from shortly. It was discovered that the source of the officer's information was indefinite, and it could be argued that he was simply trying to offer the worried wife of Lieutenant Commander Worley what comfort he could. However, this theory of the Cyclops' sinking off the capes is still in doubt. Given that she was due in Baltimore on the 13th, it made little sense for her to be so close to her final destination, so far ahead of her scheduled date of arrival. Even if it was her captain's intention to arrive ahead of schedule, it would not have been a realistic goal. The ship's speed was reduced to an estimated 240 nautical miles per day because of her damaged starboard engine, and was 1,800 nautical miles away from Baltimore. She was sailing at 10 knots. As such, it would have taken her at least a week to arrive at her destination from Barbados. That, if anything, would have made any sightings of her on March 11th or later far more believable, not the 9th. Simply put, she could not have been there off the Capes, or at the very least, she could not have been the same ship spotted by the Amolco. Even if by some maritime miracle the Cyclops had indeed arrived off the Virginia Capes on that Saturday, 
it would have been under the tensest conditions. Both the ship's surviving engine and its officers would essentially be fraying at the edges, the former from the Herculean strain of such a feat, the latter at what most sane seamen would see to be an incredibly unnecessary and dangerous risk, something that would have further burdened the already strained relationship between them and their skipper. Moreover, to further discount this theory, the Amalco's captain would later deny the claim of the sighting set forth by his third officer. Kraken attacks and mass alien abductions aside, there is still another matter to be addressed, that being the rest of the Proteus line, the sisters of the Cyclops. In their fates, which all came about within the span of just a year of each other, can that of their late sister perhaps be discerned? We can dismiss the US Jupiter out of hand. After serving in the First World War, she would go on decades later to serve in the second, this time as America's first aircraft carrier, USS Langley. She would operate in the Pacific Theater. However, on February 27, 1941, after a Japanese air attack would see her engines disable just off Java, US naval forces would scuttle her, sending her down to the bottom of the Pacific to avoid her capture by the enemy. The USS Proteus, the flagship of the Proteus Collier Line, also served all the way to the end of the First World War. She would later be decommissioned and sold to Sanguinet Terminals Limited and operated under the umbrella of the Canadian Merchant Navy. She would, however, meet her end sometime after November 23, 1941. Both she and all 58 of her crew members would be lost, vanishing without any perceivable cause within the Bermuda Triangle. The USS Nereus would also survive the First World War. She would be decommissioned and sold almost two decades later to the Aluminum Company of Canada. She would transit shipments of cargo from the Caribbean to aluminum plants in Canada and the United States, that is, until sometime after December 10, 1941. Steaming from the island of St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands, she would disappear along the very same route as her Cyclopean sister had 22 years earlier. Her loss, like that of her sisters, would also take place within the bounds of the Bermuda Triangle, and would mark the end of the sisterhood. Two things must be brought to the fore. First is that it is hard to prove that the fabled mystic forces of the Bermuda Triangle hated the Proteus sisters specifically, much harder at least than it is to prove something else. The Proteus class possessed structural features that would have made their demise that much more connected. Namely, they had a problem with rolling in heavy weather. If the Cyclops was indeed caught in a storm somewhere during her route, it would be feasible to assume that the 11,000 tons of manganese ore stored in her coal bunkers would have shifted and eventually tipped her off balance. It would have tilted her at a sharper angle until she eventually capsized. It should be remembered that her plimsoll line was recorded as being underwater by the time of her departure for Rio. That was just with 10,000 tons of coal. Manganese ore is denser and heavier. For her last shipment, she received over 1,000 tons more of it than the weight of the coal she arrived with. The report of the survey board in Rio stated that the coal had been properly secured. But Worley had arrested the only lieutenant who knew how to properly secure manganese ore in his room after a dispute. Keep in mind that the board I'm referring to is the same one that recommended she chance a voyage back to the States for repairs. She would risk the gambit of open waters at half strength rather than waiting longer to receive those repairs at Rio, or at least traveling a shorter distance to somewhere that could fix her. Even with her cargo supposedly securely loaded, she would later be seen at Barbados with her plimsoll line still underwater and the whole thing even partly listing. To take things further, there were reports that she previously suffered from hull damage due to a coal fire, hull failures, or separation of pipes. These are not signs one would necessarily attribute to a healthy ship. A theory advanced by US Navy Admiral George Van Doyer was that her acidic coal cargo could over time have seriously eroded her eye beams. These were longitudinal support beams within the ship whose slow corrosion from shipment after shipment of mildly acidic materials made them more likely to break under stress. A combination of weakened structures, dense ore, and heavy seas would be the most likely cause for her loss. Then there is the area in which the Cyclops had traveled. The Bermuda Triangle, though of course not recognized as such by the US Board of Geographic Environmental Considerations, was an unpredictable region of ocean meteorologically until very recently. The majority of Atlantic tropical storms, hurricanes, rogue waves, and other natural phenomenon passed through it. 
Prior to days of improved weather forecasting, these dangerous storms crept up on and claimed many ships. The intermingling Gulf Stream contributes to this as well, with rapid, sometimes violent changes in weather. Additionally, the large number of islands in the Caribbean Sea creates many areas of shallow water that can be treacherous to ship navigation. Absent direct proof of the ship herself, we're left to connect a few dots. It appears most likely that a synergy of events caused the loss of the Cyclops. The ship was operating on a single shaft because of the cracked cylinder that had knocked her starboard engine out of commission. This reduced her speed and maneuverability, and left her at risk of greater damage if she were to suffer a further engineering problem. She was loaded deeply, at or beyond her marks. This cargo was new to the ship. It is not clear that the officers, crew, and stevedores in Brazil knew how to properly load, stow, and trim the ore. There have been reports that she previously suffered hull damage due to a coal fire, as well as other infrastructural issues. She also had problems with extreme rolls and bad weather. On at least one occasion, it was reported that her cargo had shifted in her coal bunkers. Water entering the hull would affect the ship's stability and buoyancy, probably resulting in progressive flooding and ultimately causing her to sink. This process may have been unperceivable to the bridge watch, particularly if it occurred during dark or extreme weather. They would have had little notice that the ship was about to sink. If Cyclops had not previously lost her remaining engine, she may have continued to steam along, driving the bow underwater or capsizing. This was a conclusion even Josephus Daniels, then Secretary of the Navy, would come to accept as the most possible theory. Though this may not have happened in the case of the March 9th storm, it could have taken place in any number of the other storm systems that populated the region, ready to toss or split the lethargic, heavily laden ship in two. The weight of its own charge and the power of nature could and may have sentenced her to the bottom of the Atlantic, along with her cargo and crew. There have been many reported sightings of the ship over the years, from diplomatic agents who mistook a German ship for her, to a diver who mistook a wreck for her remains. However, to this day, the grave of the Cyclops has not been discovered. Nevertheless, Cyclops is generally regarded as the last major US Navy warship to lie undiscovered in the world's oceans. After the recent run of nearly rediscovered warships like the USS Indianapolis and carriers such as the USS Lexington, it seems likely that the ship will eventually be found. Cyclops was a large ship, and thanks to the manganese, should have an unusual magnetic signature that will make her easier to find. When she is rediscovered, it is said by some that we will likely find that neither aliens nor Atlantean technology were responsible, only human error. Until then, however, she will remain somewhere within the darkness on the bottom of the Atlantic. Until then, the words of President Woodrow Wilson will remain true for the fate of the lost 309, as well as for the century-long delay of closure for those generations of family that they left behind. Only God and the sea know what happened to the great ship. <laughs>